Let's get started. Uh, let's get started here. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to another exciting day of CS107. Today, lecture number three, we're going to continue our discussion of the C language by exploring one of the most important aspects of the language, which will be recurring all throughout the quarter, which is pointers. <clears throat> before, before we get into it, a couple of quick announcements. Hopefully you are all aware that assignment zero is due tonight at 11.59. Um, the, a reminder that there, we are not taking any late submissions for this assignment, so please make sure you get your submission in by tonight at 11.59 because, um, to earn some uh, early points uh, for this class. The other major announcement is that labs are starting up this week. In particular, labs, I think mo many students would say that labs are one of their uh, favorite parts of this class. And especially for, for this week and for the next couple of labs, the labs will be really useful for your assignments. So in particular, this week's lab and today's lecture also will be really useful when working on assignment one. So be sure to check that out. All right. Just like last time, I want to start the day by giving you an overview of what our goals are for um, where we want to be by the end of today's lecture. Today, uh, there, there are three main goals. The first is that we will just start by giving a brief introduction into what pointers are and talk about the basic operations that we can do on pointers. Then uh, we will talk about uh, allocating memory in the heap. So we will compare, we will talk about a couple different ways we can get memory and what maybe discuss a little bit about what the trade-offs are. It's okay if you, at this moment, don't know what the heap is. That's part of the discussion. And then lastly, we'll talk about arrays and this, what will probably be very new concept to most of you called pointer arithmetic, and we'll tie arrays back into the first two topics. Today's lecture and most of, and really this, this whole week of content is going to be vital throughout the quarter. We're going to, we're going to cover, we're going to start by talking about pointers today. We're going to cover them for about a week. And then we're just going to keep coming back to pointers week after week in this class. You're, there's pretty much no end in sight to, to our discussion of pointers. And so it's going to be really important that we clear up any confusion, any sort of misunderstandings right away. Um, I expect that many of you will have lots of questions, and that's, that's great. So please do ask them as we go along here. It's a lot better for us to clear stuff up now rather than try to rush ahead and get through more content only to find out that, find out later that you missed something important and are having trouble kind of filling in the gaps. All right. So let's just get into it. Before I show you some examples and some of the actual raw mechanics of pointers, I want to motivate them a little bit and tell you why we are covering pointers and why in particular so early. Now you've already seen a few examples of how pointers are used from your days in 106B or X. For example, you saw them used all over the place in some of the later data structures that you were implementing. For linked lists, binary trees, uh, graphs, if you worked on, if you saw the implementation there, they all counted on using pointers. Um, something that you also maybe saw a little bit of is that pointers are also really convenient for sharing, for sharing objects. So for example, if I have a program that's keeping track of student enrollments and I have a student who's enrolled in two different classes, say CS107 and CS109, rather than duplicating this, all of the student's information when storing their information for 107 and then storing their information for 109, 
I can keep one copy of their information and just have pointers to, just have pointers to it um, from each class that they're in. Just as a, just a little example, um, just stuff that you've seen, you've maybe seen a little bit of already. In C, we'll use pointers in those ways as well, but we're also going to see them just kind of show up everywhere. They're, there's pretty much no way to program in C that doesn't inevitably involve pointers in some way. And, and we'll see that even for cases like arrays and strings, some of these, these things that we thought were these kind of basic data types, pointers are going to show up there as well. And the last point that I have there, pass by reference, is kind of an interesting example where C++ has some special syntax for passing variables by reference. Well, in C, we don't have those syntactic conveniences, and so we kind of just have to, we kind of have to make it, make it up our own way, and the way we will end up doing that will be through pointers. So hopefully that's just a little bit of motivation for why it is that we think pointers are so important that we cover them starting in lecture number three. So here we go. Let's just get into it and talk about and talk about the pointer operations. Now, for all of today, I will be I'll be staying pretty much on the slides because um, we'll need to be talking about the we'll need to be looking at I think covering pointers is most effective when we actually have a picture of what's going on in memory as we start as we execute each line of code. So that's why I've got the code here on the left, and I've got a picture of memory on the right. Now before I actually get into the specific example of this piece of code, I want to talk a little bit about what this diagram is so that we're all on the same page. So here I've got a picture of memory. On the left here, I've got the addresses of I've got the addresses, which are essentially numbers which represent a, which refer to a location in memory. So the lowest address in memory I have written kind of near the bottom, starting at zero. There's a bunch of stuff there, and then I'm, I'm mostly making up these addresses for our convenience, but you might imagine around here we have address 9000 going up to, going up to whatever. Um, in, the, in the boxes themselves, I'll be writing the, the contents of memory. So for example, here we can see that the variable, and I've, I'll write the variable name sort of to the right of the box if, if there is a, a good name for that variable, just as a, just as a convenience to, to sort of keep track. So here, for example, I have the variable i, which is an int. We can see that from the code. It stores the value 42, and we can see that the, the box containing the 42 is located at address 9000. We can see the same thing happening for J, and then also, well, we'll get to P and Q in a second. All right. Now, a couple things to note about this diagram right away. First of all, you'll notice that I'm not, that the addresses aren't just counting up one after another. That, for example, here, this isn't 9001, and this isn't 9002. I'm kind of skipping a few addresses. So what's up with that? Well, we'll talk, a lot more about data representation in a couple of weeks. We'll talk about how to store, how we actually store ints, and how we store addresses, and how we store characters, and floating point numbers, and all that. But for now, I need to introduce you to the, the terminology of a byte. So a byte of memory is essentially a, just a small unit of memory where we can store something. And when we talk about addresses, when we use the number like 9,000, this is the address of a particular byte in memory. But the problem is we can't store an entire int in one byte of memory. An int is bigger than that. In fact, on our machines, ints are four bytes. So what that means is that even though I'll be using sort of a sort of shorthand language like i is stored at address 9000. What I actually mean, since i is an int, and ints take up four bytes, is that i is stored at address, starts at address 9000, 
but will also occupy addresses 9001, 9002, and 9003. And then, so then starting at address 9004 will be the location, will be the memory for J, and J will take up 9004, 5, 6, and 7. Okay? And from the diagram, I'll, you know, I'll try to keep these diagrams to scale. We can see that pointers, just as a quick, this is somewhat of an aside, pointers take up twice the amount of space that, that ints take up. Pointers take up eight bytes, which is why I've got 9008 next to P, and then I skip eight, and, 9000, and Q starts at address 9016. Any questions about the, just the basics of the diagram? That it's pointing to. Uh, that's a good question. You're asking, is it always, so is, is a pointer size always twice the type? No, actually, a pointer size in, on our machine is always eight bytes, no matter what it points to. Um, so then, yeah. uh, is there ever a reason to use an int pointer? Because wouldn't it be better to just pass the int itself by reference? Ah, <coughs> so you're asking, wouldn't it be better to pass the int by reference? But we're in C, we don't know what by reference means. Um, in fact, it just it doesn't exist. Um, so we will have no choice ultimately. Is there a reason that using int pointers takes up more space than the original instance? Is there a reason? Well, there will be lots of reasons to use pointers. I mean, fun, like fundamentally, we'll just we'll just like so. Okay, yeah, you're looking at this example and you're saying, well, this example is kind of silly. Instead of using you know p and q, I could just be using i and j or whatever. Um, we will certainly see lots of reasons that pointers will just naturally show up, and then we kind of have no choice. But, but to accept the fact that they are twice the size of ints, uh, oh well. So, yeah. if the integer i um, covers addresses 9003, 9, uh -huh. if the pointer points at, say, 9001, will it still be pointing at the integer? Yeah, so, the, so if I have a pointer that points to, um, that points to 9001, it won't be pointing at i anymore um, because it'll be kind of pointing halfway between i and j. Does that kind of make sense? Like, so, okay, so I should introduce the, the pointer notation and the, the mechanics a little bit, but here I've, I'm representing what a pointer variable is at its core is it is, a, it is a variable which instead of storing a number itself, like 107 or 42, it stores an address. And so I'm using these arrows to show the pointer pointing to that location. Uh, and yeah, so if I had, now I, I have the, the, there's a limitation in my diagram here, which is that the arrow's kind of pointing kind of randomly in the, at the box itself. You kind of have to think of, though, like this arrow really pointing here at the very beginning at 9,000. And then the, the system knows that by pointing to 9,000, when I, when I want to read the int out, it knows to read this entire box. So if I were to point at 9001, I won't read the entire box. I'll read kind of half of this box into this next box. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Cool. Why do you need eight bits of memory? Say that again? Why do you ints need four bits of memory? Um, ints need four, so it's actually four bytes in memory. Um, the specifics are, are, we will certainly cover in a couple of weeks. The short answer is because one byte wouldn't be big enough to write most interesting numbers. Um, we need, and, and that, the same rule applies for, for pointers. We just need more, we need to use more bytes because there is a limit to how many things, to how much we can write in one byte of memory. And it was determined by some pretty smart people that one byte just isn't enough to write enough interesting integers. <laughs> Anything else? So if, if you were to call like the value of 9001, what would it print out? Uh, you could you could try it. Roughly speaking, for now it'll print out. I don't know because um, because we haven't talked about the actual representation of the bytes. So we would need to understand. Well, so if I tell you that an int is stored at address nine thousand and it goes up to nine thousand three, what is in each of those four bytes? We don't know that yet. For now, our sort of simple our, our simpler world is just to say that the int is stored at 9,000, and then when you point to 9,001, I don't really know. But we will absolutely see that um, very, very shortly in, in a, probably a couple of weeks. Anything else? 
Okay, so let me introduce the 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 syntax here. Uh, you know, some of you have maybe jumped ahead a little bit to to look at the the code, and that's that's fine. So here we've got we're declaring two pointers, p and q, and I'm introducing what this this uh, the syntax should look. I, I think you should have seen this in 106b, but you know just just to make sure we're on the same we are on the same page. We can say in star p to declare a variable whose type is pointer to integer, and we assign it to be the value address of i. So the ampersand is, per, is read address of, and what that does is it stores in p, so here in this diagram, well, it stores where i is located in memory. So we see that i is located at address 9000, so we store the 9000 inside of the box for p. Now, I mentioned this arrow. I've drawn these arrows as a kind of convenience to help us follow the pointers. I do want to just quickly mention that the arrows don't actually exist in memory at all. They're merely visual conveniences. In memory, all there is is this 9000. So it, there's nothing special about, you know, there isn't any kind of, like, what happens if the arrow points somewhere else? If the arrow points somewhere else, it's a bug on my slide, right? Um, the, so if the number is 9,000, then we, are, we interpret that as meaning that P points to this box. Is that okay? So we do the same for Q, and that is the first of our, our pointer operators. The second of them, so adding another line here, now we're asking, Let's say we have, we've got p, and we'd like to print out the value that p is pointing to. So here I, I'm using the star operator, which we read as dereference. And so when I dereference p, that means that I look in the box for p, I see the number 9,000, or I look at the arrow, and I follow that arrow, or go to address 9,000, and I read the contents of that box. So here, this printf of star p will print out the number 42. Am I sure of your code? Yeah. You have int star p with the address of i. Sure. Are you, is that an int star named p, or are you dereferencing p? Ah, good question. Um, you're asking about, the, so this line, is it in, it is not, it is, in the case of declaring a variable, the star means this is a pointer. So this line is declaring an int star, which I've named p. This line is declaring an int star, which I've named q. That is a different star, and I realize it's, it can get a little confusing. That is a, the, a, a slightly different use of the star than down here, which is actually a dereference. Does that difference make sense? So this is just declaring a variable. This is not the dereference operator. This is. the same, roughly? Uh, like, or does it have to go through everything up to that address? Like, if you say, like, find the thing at address 9,000, does it have to go through the first 9,000 to get there? Ah, so you're essentially asking, is, is, what is the big O running time of memory access? Um, it's certainly not linear. That would be pretty awful. Um, especially on these, like, 64-bit machines, like, the, the memory is huge. Uh, you can imagine, like, 2 to the 64 operations is, is more, than a, more than a lifetime. And, in, in seconds more often. Um, it's not linear. It's, we can think of it for now as constant time access to any, any location in memory. We'll realize like eight weeks down the line that that's not true, but for the first eight weeks, we can go along with it. It's constant time. Anything else? Question. Yeah. What happens if you try to dereference a non-pointer? Ah, good question. So what if I say, um, what if I say like star i, for example, right? Uh, that's just a compiler error. It doesn't, it doesn't mean anything um, because it wasn't a pointer variable and the compiler doesn't know what to make of that. So it'll just crash. Or, sorry, it'll give you an error. It'll give you a compiler error, one of the few. Question? Yep. Is there any difference in uh, how a number 9,000 would be stored as opposed to an address of 9,000? That's a really good question. Is there, a, is there a difference between storing the number 9,000 and the address 9,000? The short answer is actually no. Um, there is a, again, there is a longer discussion about representing data, about how do we represent addresses, how do we represent integers, and so on. But the short answer is actually no, that, that in memory, they're actually going to end up looking kind of the same, except that the, the address version 
has twice the amount of space, so then it just gets filled with a bunch of zeros. Question? Yep. Uh, what do we need to use parentheses around the, uh, like, a dereference? Uh, I saw it in the textbook, and I, I can't remember exactly. Oh, yeah. I, well, I'll actually get to that way later. But essentially, um, the star is a, is a prefix operator, so it's sort of like a, think of it like the, the exclamation point operator or like the minus sign. Um, any case where you're going to do some expression. So if I weren't doing star p, I was doing star of some complicated thing, then I would need parentheses. But we'll see some examples of that later. Anything else? These are great questions. OK. So now that we've got the, the basics of the pointers, stars, and ampersands down, Here's a little exercise for you to just make sure we kind of have a little bit of working understanding of, of how pointers, how pointers are, are working out. So here I've got four different lines of code that I'm going to ask you to puzzle through a little bit. Uh, first of all, I should say each of these lines, treat them as executing completely separately. So think of line number one happening to this diagram and then going back to the original code and then only doing line two and then going back to the original code. So don't think of them as happening one after another. And what I'm going to have you do is sort of look at each of these lines and think about what it's actually going to do to our memory. What is, what's going to change? And, and then there's sort of this slightly more subtle question of, is that, a, is that a reasonable thing to do? And the way we're going to do this is we'll take maybe, I, w I want you to take maybe 20 or 20 seconds or, or 30 seconds to just Work it out, kind of work out each of these on your own a little bit. Just kind of work through, work through it a bit. And then take another maybe 45 seconds to a minute to talk it out with your neighbor. So let's just, for now, take a few seconds to work it out on your own. Make through a couple of these. Okay, now if you have a, someone next to you or something, talk to them. See if you guys got the same answer. See if you, you disagree on anything. Take maybe 15 more seconds. Finish up some, finish up your thoughts. Try to get a prediction for at least one of these. All right. All right. Let's regroup. Let's regroup here and, and talk about what you found out. Okay. <laughs> so we'll talk about each of these one at a time. Uh, let's start with, I, I got the slide indicators to make sure I'm on the right page, but let's talk about number one, P equals Q. Can anyone offer an idea of what this line is going to do? Really? I guess it will make P point to the same um, thing that Q is pointing to, which is J. Right. So how is that going to change our, our diagram? Um, so P will point to J as well. OK. And then what, what goes in this box? Uh, 9,004. 9,004. Does that make sense to everyone? So we don't have a star here on this line, which means we don't follow any arrows. So all we do is we look at the value, the thing that's in Q's box, which is 9,004, and we copy it over to P's box. So now we've got 9,004 in both places. That also updates our arrow. And this is now, and we now say that, just a quick intro of terminolo introduction of terminology here, we say that P and Q are aliases because they point to the same thing. That one okay? 
Why wouldn't he be 9016? Uh, oh. So the 9016 is where Q is located in memory. But the value that Q stores is 9004. First of all, does that distinction kind of make sense? Yeah. Okay. So by saying P equals Q, if I just use the name of a pointer, just like if I use the name of a variable, that means go into that box and get the value out of that box. If I said P equals, now this would be maybe a weird type thing, but if I said P equals address of Q, if I put an ampersand Q there, then P would be 9016. Does that make sense? Great. Anything else about this one? Okay, let's go to the next one. Star P equals star Q. Oh, by the way, for that first one, like, that's a reasonable thing to do, right? I've got two pointers, they now point to the same variable. Uh, maybe I was gonna pass one of them, maybe I'm gonna use one of them differently. Nothing egregious, nothing wrong with that. Okay, star P equals star Q. What is this gonna do? So I think it'll change um, the value of I to be 107. Okay. Sounds good. So we've got, so we've got the stars, meaning follow the arrows. We follow the arrow for Q first, so we evaluate the right hand side first. Follow the arrow, we pull the number out, got my mouse, okay. We get the number 107, and then we follow the arrow for P, and we put it into that box. Question? Yep. Why doesn't it dereference P and say that you're trying to get whatever you dereference it to, to Q? Because we said star P equals star Q. So do we not do reference P because P is in the left hand side? We do do reference P in the sense that, so here's P, we will, so the star P means we have to follow the arrow and write the result of what we got, which is the 107, into the box at the end of the arrow. Uh, does that make sense? This is, the type of star P is int. So, so you're, and the type of star P is also int. That's right. Yeah, so do you see how this is, this is different than saying, so in the previous case we said P equals something, and that changed the box up here. That changed P's box. Star P means follow the arrow and then write the answer into, into the box at the end of the arrow. So that's, that's the difference. Is that okay? Anything about this one? Other questions about this? Star P is equal to Q. Would there be enough memory in in um, the the variable X yeah. well, or the address? We'll, we'll get to that in like literally right now. <laughs> okay. Anything else about about two real quick, just to make sure. If you dereference a pointer, do you lose the pointer, or can you still access it later on? No, we don't. So we don't lose the pointer or anything. We we still have P and Q. We can we can star P and then somewhere later star P again. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, it's just a variable, stores an address. Can you go over and find exactly what it means to dereference a pointer? So dereferencing a pointer. So when we say star P or we say, so let's just do star Q first, since it's on the right hand side. Dereferencing a pointer means, okay, star Q. We go to the box where Q is, which we've assigned to Q, right? It's this box. It contains the, the value 9004. And dereferencing means we're going to we're going to go to address 9004, or equivalently, we're going to follow the arrow that's coming out of that box, and then we're going to look inside the box that the arrow is pointing to. Or we're going to look inside the box that goes with 9004. Is that okay? And then dereferencing P, the same idea. Inside the box P, there's 9000. So we go to address 9000, or equivalently, follow the arrow, and then we go into that box, and here we would write the answer or the value that we're assigning into this box. Question? Yep. So dereferencing is just looking at the value in that box? <coughs> yes. As opposed to changing it. Well, I could, if I dereference it on the right, then I'm reading it out, right? If I dereference on the left, then I'm changing it. Does that make sense? So like with, with P here, I, I said star P equals something, so I'm going to that box and I'm changing it. If I say star Q, then I'm just reading it out. Okay. All right. So back to that other question. Now we've got star p equals q. What do we suppose is going to happen here? Any 
any... It definitely seems kind of weird, doesn't it? Like, something, <coughs> something weird's gonna happen. Um, if we just had to sort of trudge forward and just make it work, what do you suppose the memory diagram would look like? I would equal 9004. Yeah, so we would, we would essentially try to take the value in, in Q, this 9004, we just try to stuff it in this box. Now, there was a question earlier about, well, would we even have enough space? And the answer is, well, no, the box is too small. Um, in this case, 9004 would happen to fit, probably, but if the, if the address were larger, then we would probably lose some stuff. Now, a note here, so we get a warning from this that tells us that we, we assigned, we, we took a pointer, in this case we took, or in some sense we took an address, is probably it would be a better, a more precise way of saying it. We took the address 9004 and we tried to stick it into an integer variable. That seems like not the right thing to do, but Tyler's gonna let us do it with a warning. This is almost never what you want, so you wanna be very careful. Very careful about that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if I had been uh, along, uh, would you still get the warning? Yeah. So if I were larger, if it were a long, which would have enough, which would actually in our system be the same size as a pointer, we would still get the warning because you still probably don't want to take a, a random address and stuff it into a number, a variable that was supposed to be a number. That still seems bad. Um, because now if I print out i, I'm just gonna get some obscure number. I, like, remember that the user isn't seeing these addresses. The user doesn't know about address 9000 or 9004. So printing it out and suddenly seeing the 9004 would be pretty, pretty jarring. Um, yep. So say like q like tells someone like, really, some really big number. That could fit in, in, in okay. okay. And then you just did like star p equals q. Would that overwrite like what j was holding or what it just uh, yeah, so your, your question is about, so like would it, how would it handle overriding the big number? It, it's not gonna overwrite, it's not gonna overwrite any other memory except just in this box, and it'll, it'll throw some stuff away. We'll see exactly what it throws away in a couple of weeks. A lot of these questions are, are, are actually data representation questions, which is fine. I mean, we certainly, you know, they'll, they're certainly coming up now, um, and we're certainly seeing, we're starting to see sort of why learning about how the, how everything is represented and how these operations behave is, is going to be useful. But to short, to briefly answer your question, it'll just throw some bits away. Okay. All right, let's do the, the last one. P equals star Q. What do we suppose this is going to do? So once again, this definitely seems kind of bad. It's kind of, it seems like it's kind of the opposite, right? But let's let's just trace through it a little. So we've got so we're gonna do star q, and star q means okay. We, we we look inside the box q. We follow the arrow to this location. We've got the number one hundred seven. We take it out, and then we put it in the box where p is. No arrow following. Right. So we do that. We put the 107 in here. Notice the arrow, I got rid of the arrow for P because 107 is no longer 9000, so it's not pointing at anything useful anymore. Here again, we get a warning. It's basically the analogous warning. But I would argue this is kind of a little bit worse than the last example. Because at least with the last example, you had a number that now has some random value in it. And that's bad, but it's probably not gonna like crash or anything. Now we have a pointer, and that pointer is storing a completely bogus address. I can tell you right now that 107 is definitely not a valid address. This line in itself will not crash. It won't cause any, it won't immediately cause a problem. However, if I then try to dereference P, I'll look inside the box for P, I'll see the address 107, We'll try to go to 107 in memory and see if there's a number there. There won't be. There just won't be. 
And so that is when we will get our segmentation fault, indicating that we had some pointer, we followed it, wasn't pointing anywhere good. Now the program cannot continue. Uh, what do you mean get the address of i? Like, give an example. Uh, we do, right? Look right here. You mean, sorry, you're saying ampersand or star? So, I mean, like, so here I'm using ampersand i, right? That's fine. It's saying, so the ampersand, the address of i is 9,000, right? Yeah, anything else? If, uh, what if seven was a valid address? Uh -huh. Could the program pull whatever data isn't there? Yeah. Even if it's like restricted or like protected? Well, like, well OK, I mean, if there's some weird like, if there, if there's some protection issue, then yeah. I mean, it, val like, when I say valid, I usually mean memory that I can read and write to. Um, so. Yeah, so that, so it's like if 107 happened to be a place that I, like that some other part of my program was using, well, guess what? Now I'm reading and writing to that place. Oops. Um, and if it wasn't valid, if I wasn't allowed to read from it, if I wasn't allowed to write to it, or whatever the case was that I was trying to do, then I would get the cycle. Anything else? <laughs> How would typecasting change the results at all? Like you mentioned that, that that is the warning you would get. Yeah, so the warning says something about without a cast. That's, it's kind of an, uh, an unfortunate warning in a sense, because you probably still don't want to cast either of these. Um, the, what we will basically see is that if we could basically force the compiler to not give us the warning, but the effect of the memory diagram would be identical. So we would still, in the case of number three, we would still get some random bogus value stored in this box. In the case of number four, we'd still get some bogus address stored in this box. Neither of them is good. But we would just get the compiler to shut up. Is that any better? Not really. So the broad conclusion here is that the important thing to, keep, to, to take, make very careful note of is the types on the left and the right-hand side of our equal signs, especially with, um, with assignments. You'll notice that for the first two lines, the types match. So P and Q are both int stars, so this first line is assigning an int star to an int star. If I take star P or star Q, dereferencing turns an int star into an int, so then line number two assigns, assigns an int to an int. And both of those, both one and two, are totally reasonable. Three and four, on the other hand, are not because I am assigning an int to an int star or vice versa. And that is, well, pretty much, I'll just go on a limb and say, that's never what you want. So, so watch for these warnings. Like, like we discussed on Friday, be very vigilant that even though it says warning, it's probably indicative of a deeper bug, and we certainly shouldn't try to hack our way around it. Uh -huh. um, I didn't want to just memorize what generates a warning and what generates an error. Yeah. Can you start, maybe start to establish some patterns for like these are sure. the kinds of things that will give you warnings and these are the kinds of things that will just go right through. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So, so what kinds of things will generate warnings? What kinds of things will generate errors? Um, it's okay. It's a little tricky. Like a lot of it is going to be kind of recognizing. Like at this early stage, it might be a little bit hard to fill in all of those gaps. I can give you the, the rough rule of thumb, which is that if there is some interpretation of what you've asked the program to do, even if that interpretation seems wrong, the compiler will let it happen. So in both three and four, we could imagine what that would look like to the memory diagram. As a result, the compiler says, since I can imagine what that would look like, I'll let you do it. That's why it's a warning. If the, mm? the dereferencing the number 107 is not feasible because. Uh, so so dereferencing, so if I just say like star 107? Well, like you or, said, the oh. 107 was stored in, in the slot for P, and then you try to dereference P, that would give you a cycle. Oh, sure. 
So I should be precise here that a seg fault, this isn't happening at compile time. This is when I run the program and I get to that printf, then I'll follow that pointer and realize there's, there's no memory there. So a seg fault is going to happen whenever I've got, whenever I try to follow a pointer that just isn't pointing to anything, to any valid memory. Then the program will crash when I run it. That isn't, that isn't a compiler issue. Can we do, do reference an int, like if it has the same value of an address? Uh, so if we just say like star on an int variable, pretty sure, well, no, well, the problem there is, there, there are a few problems with that, as it turns out. Like, for example, the, the compiler wouldn't know what type to give you back, right? So I can't say, so let's say I, I say star i. Well, what does that mean? Like, even if I had a valid address, what, what, what should I give you back? Should I give you back an int? Should I give you back a double? Um, so the compiler doesn't know how to interpret that. So you cannot dereference just a number, and that'll be a compiler error. Because there is no kind of good interpretation of what that means, because we don't know, we don't know what the box at the other end of the arrow looks like. Okay? What would happen if you declared, like, say you declared a pointer for an integer, and then you declared a pointer for, say, like a character, and then you use pointer assignment, and you point yeah. the integer character to the... To yeah, the great question. Uh, can you wait four slides? I'll get there. Okay, cool. Yeah, uh, literally, yeah, okay. Um, so, so let me just give you a couple more little facts about pointers. We've explored a lot of these already, but... Here I just want to make a quick note about uninitialized pointers. We've talked lots about uninitialized variables, um, and pointers are no different. So if I have a variable, if I have, here I have two variables, I've got i and I've got star, in star, in star, or I've got int i and int star p. I have not initialized either of those variables, and the issue that I'm sort of trying to work out here is, well, what would happen if I print out i? What happens if I print out star p? And we've already talked a little bit about this. Um, in fact, we saw the first one on Friday. What happens if I print out i? Well, it's, I'm going to get some unpredictable value. Whatever happened to be in that box, I'm going to get it. Maybe it's zero. Maybe it's 4,190,000. Maybe it's 107, whatever. Whatever's in the box, here you go. It's not going to crash. There's nothing wrong. With, like, the, the, I haven't accessed any memory that wasn't mine or anything. It's just, you know, I'm just going to get some random value. On the other hand, dereferencing an uninitialized pointer, that's actually pretty bad. Because just like when the pointer was storing the value 107 and 107 wasn't a valid address, if this pointer happens to be pointing at an address that I'm allowed to read and write from, then I guess I get away with it, but only kind of. I mean, it is somebody else's memory. So I I'm just going to get bitten later. Um, and if it's not a valid address in memory, then we'll get a seg fault. And briefly, this is part of the reason why uh, memory errors are so difficult to debug in general, that it's possible that you, know, you have some uninitialized pointer here, and it happens to be pointing at a valid location. And then, and that might you know, cause some change in some other part of the program that was using that location. And now, and so you look at that other part of the program and you're like, that code is fine. I don't see what could be changing the memory behind the scenes, what's happening here. And as it turns out, your bug was somewhere completely different. Um, and so this is why tools like uh, GDB and Valgrind, which will explore lots more of this week and next week, are, are really helpful for trying to work out some of these errors. Okay. Um, also want to make a super quick note about null pointers. Since you should have seen null in 106b, we can assign a pointer equal to the special word keyword null, all caps. That basically puts a zero in that box. Zero is never a valid address. This means that if I dereference that pointer, that is a guaranteed seg fault. However, null is still really useful because I can use it to check, because I can check whether or not p equals null with like an if statement like this to know, for example, that I've reached the end of my linked list or that I haven't 
set p to point to anything else. So checking whether you know, a, a pointer equals a certain address or a certain thing, even if that address is not valid, that, that's OK. Dereferencing it, not so much. Yep. You have addresses <laughs> defined for 0 to 9,000. So like, what do you mean when you say valid memory address if like, 0 is defined on there? So I put 0 down here just to show you that I'm starting down here. Like, memory is just this big contiguous block from 0 up to who knows how much. Um, and what we'll see is that most of memory isn't really ours to just muck with. We can't just go to the location 0 and get something there. Um, we'll need to actually use some, uh, some functions, we'll actually see them very shortly, um, to actually ask for memory. So even though the whole space of memory starts at 0 and then just goes all the way up to, to big number, um, mo mostly, most, if we just picked a random location, if we just picked a random address in the middle of that range and dereferenced it, there's probably not actually any memory there to write any, to, to do so that when we get a site fault. Does that kind of make sense? So essentially, if I don't have a box, that means there's no memory there. That we haven't like allocated, allocated the memory for that yet. All right. So back to that, that last question about what happens if I assign two different, uh, if I do pointer assignment with two types. So here I'm using int star and double star, but same idea with uh, character star, et cetera. Um, if I just try to do an assignment here, um, you know, dp equals ip, I get a warning. Um, why is it a warning and not an error? Well, it's a warning because we could imagine what that would do to the memory diagram. It just copies the address from one place into the other place. Um, as I mentioned briefly at the beginning, pointers are this, all, all pointers are the same size. All pointers are eight bytes. So addresses are, are, are eight bytes long. So every pointer is the same size. So the assignment would, in that sense, kind of make sense, except that the, except that the types don't match, so we get a warning, which is nice of the compiler, because that's probably not what you wanted. Um, so yeah, just be aware of the types. We will explore type safety and all that later, like what happens if I dereference DP after I make this assignment? What happens if I, um, you know, are there reasons that I would actually want to do an assignment like this, and therefore I would want to use something like a typecast to make this warning go away? It turns out there are, and we'll explore those a little bit later. But for now, as we're just starting out learning about pointers, this is probably wrong. OK? Um, question? Yep. What would happen if um, you have, you declare in star p, but you do not set it to anything. So you don't set it to null, you don't set it to anything. Uh -huh. And then you try to like, check if it equals null. Yeah. Would it think that it equals null or would it equal whatever the computer is? <laughs> well, right. So it'll equal whatever happened to be there. So we actually saw that null is the value 0. So if there happened to be a zero in that box, then it would say, great, it's null. And if there wasn't a zero, then it would say, no, it's not. Still shouldn't dereference it, because it's still pointing at who knows where. But that's what you get, right? So question. Yep. Uh, what if you're incompatible point types you take different amounts of storage? So for example, if you had like a in star p and a long star q, yeah. you said like q equals q, yeah. and then try to dereference q. Sure, right. So that's. Uh, You'll still get this warning. So it turns out doubles are a different size than int. Double are actually take eight bytes. Um, it, you'll still get this warning. Dereferencing it means you'll, I mean, you'll get it. There's kind of a bigger problem, which is that, like, just generally, what does it mean if I try to read memory that was of one type as another type? And for now, until we actually discuss data representation, the answer is I don't know what I'm going to get there. Um, in two weeks, you'll know exactly what you're going to get there. All right. Anything else about the pointer stuff before we just the this this piece before we switch switch gears a little bit? Okay. So now I'm going to seemingly switch gears and just talk about allocating memory a little. 
So far, we've been showing memory allocation on the stack. We've been looking entirely about, uh, we were talking entirely about memory that, that was being set aside because we declared some local variables inside of a function. That memory comes from a location called the stack. Um, and an important property of that location is that the memory is automatically cleaned up when the function returns. So in all of the examples, imagine that all of that code was running inside of a particular function. And when that function returns, then all the memory kind of goes away and we don't have to, we don't have to deal with it. But there are situations where we need to use a different way of allocating memory. In 106B, you saw this already. When you allocated a linked list node, for example, you didn't just say, you know, node, uh, node, my new node. You said, or, you know, whatever. You said, node star p, let's say, equals new node. So you use the, the keyword new to get memory for that linked list node. Um, and we'll, and we will talk about the trade-offs for why we want to use the stack versus the heap uh, later, probably at the beginning of Friday's lecture. But so for now, just kind of accept that there is this other place for getting memory that where we can stay more in control over how, how long we get to use that memory. So the equivalent to calling new on saying like, for example, new node is in C, we don't have objects, so we don't have something like the new keyword. We have this, instead we have this function called malloc. And rather than taking a type like new did, malloc takes a size. It takes a number of bytes, and all it does is it just gives us back a pointer to that many bytes. Okay, that's fine, but how do I know how many bytes things are? I mean, I told you that ints were four bytes and pointers are eight bytes and stuff, but how would you, like, that might vary from machine to machine. How would you actually be able to, to write code that, that, that uses that size information um, if you didn't know it? Well, that's where this size of operator comes in. So if I call size of on a type, so for example, size of int, I'll get back the number of bytes that an int would take up on this particular machine you know, in this particular, with this particular compiler. So I can put the two of these together to allocate enough space for, say, an int or a double. Now, just like with operator new in C++, we are now responsible for freeing the memory when we're done. So in C++, you had something like operator delete. So you said delete p to indicate that you were done with that memory. Here, we have an analogous function called free. We say free, and we pass it a pointer, and it will release the memory for that pointer. So let me show you a quick example of this. Here we've got, I've got the, I've got the code, and I'm, I'm showing how to combine the malloc and the size of. This is a very common idiom in C, is to allocate. So here I'm going to say int star p, which I've allocated here, or I've, I've drawn here, is equal to malloc for the size of an int. So this says, all right, I'm going to set aside enough space to store one int. Now you'll notice that I drew the space for that int at a completely different location. And actually, it's actually at a much lower address. I just want to emphasize here that there is, there is a separation between the memory that we're getting for these local variables and the memory that malloc is giving us back. They're not in, in different, they're, they're in different locations of memory different kind of regions. And so once I've got the malloc, I have a malloc returns the address 2000 in this case. I store that into P and I can dereference it and I can write a value like 17 there. Does this, any questions about this piece? So when I'm done, with that memory, let's say I did a bunch more stuff in the, in the middle here, then I could call free of p. Notice this is not free of star p or, or ampersand p. We, we pass free the pointer itself. So in some sense, we're thinking we call free on the address 2000 in this case. Um, and, and that will tell malloc to mark this location as no longer in use. 
This brings up a few interesting questions. First of all, what happens to the actual pointer after I call free? So here I've got free p. So then what happens after that? What happens to p? Well, as it turns out, nothing. P is still pointing at 2000. Huh, well that's kind of weird. What happens then if I decide to dereference p or I decide to do any of these weird things? Well, it turns out not nothing special in the sense that um, we've, told, we've told the system that we are no longer using the memory at address 2000. That doesn't mean that the memory isn't there. I mean, we set it aside once and at least, so the analogy that, we, that, that I like to use here is to think about if you were like leasing an apartment, for example. And so you go and you get an apartment lease and you get a key, you go in, you move in, you, you live there for a while. And then when you're done, you say, okay, I want to move out now. And you tell your landlord, hey, I'm moving out. And they say, okay, great. And they probably ask you for your key back. But I mean, what if you like made a copy of that key, for example? And then after you moved out, you decide, oh, I'm just going to see if I can get back in. I mean, so what's going to happen? Well, other than the cops getting called probably, I mean, for a while you'll probably be able to just, you'll probably be able to get in. And until somebody else moves in, you'll even be able to leave your stuff there if you really wanted to. But why shouldn't you? Well, because eventually somebody else is going to move in there. And when they move in, you might just show up one day and there will be somebody else's stuff. Or the stuff that you left there is just gone. So that's what happens here. We've called free that doesn't change the contents of the pointer variable, that doesn't change this box at all. I no longer know what is in this box. I no longer know what is at address 2000 because I said that I don't want it anymore. I could try to read from it. I could try to write to it. But these are not good ideas because eventually that's going to become somebody else's memory, and now I've really just messed with somebody else. I should say, it's, when I say somebody else, I'm mostly thinking of another function in the same program. On a, a modern systems, se different programs are completely separated, so they can't mess with each other's memory. But, um, so, but another function could have called malloc, gotten address 2000, started writing stuff there, and whoops, we just overwrote it. Should also note that calling free on the same pointer twice, also not okay. You might think, gosh, I mean, it should be able to handle that, right? It's already marked as free. Like, what, what's wrong with calling, it, calling free again? Well, it turns out um, C was written with performance in mind, so there's just no check. If you call free on the same pointer twice, you're in trouble. It will probably crash or at the very least lead to some kind of corruption or bad, bad times. Any questions about this heap stuff so far? Um, I don't know. It's like it's uninitialized, basically, at this point. Because yeah, if if free happened to not change the memory, then sure it would print seventeen. But do you know if it changed the memory? No, you don't. Sure. Why would you allocate memory first instead of uh, initializing like an integer first and then setting the pointer to the address of the integer? So you're essentially asking why call malloc as yeah. opposed to do it like we did before. Ah, uh, yes, that is a bigger question. I'm probably going to have to come back to it on Friday. But there are situations where I need, I'll need the memory, I need the memory not in a local variable. So in the case, in the example that we saw at the very beginning when I said int star p equals ampersand i, i will go away when the function returns. Does that make sense? Because it's a local variable for that function. If I need that memory to stick around, so think of like a linked list where I've got a bunch of nodes and I want all the nodes to stick around even after a function returns, then I need to use something like malloc. Okay. But don't worry, we'll, we'll see that again. Anything else? Um, so what happens when you're using so free P sure. and the computer starts using Yep. and then you do dereference T yep. equals 35. Yep. Uh, and then like will, will it run and then like the computer 
goes back and it's like, what's this number doing here? And then it might crash some other part of your computer. Well, yeah, so, so you're going to write the 35 there. And then, so like I said, most P, different programs will be completely separate. Back in the old days, yeah, you could have totally just wiped out some other program. Like, maybe that was, I don't know, some really important part of like your text editor, and now your text editor crashes because you overwrote it, its memory. Um, in modern systems, what will happen is if some other part of your program was using that memory because it also called malloc size of int and got address 2000, then yeah, it's going to print it out or it's going to look at it and what's this 35 doing here? And I don't know, your code probably wasn't ready to handle an unexpected 35 showing up. Um, it shouldn't be, right? That, that, this just shouldn't happen. So, so then it will just respond as, as it would. Anything else? So if you try to dereference P after it's freed, we're going to get some value that's there. It's not going to crash because it is still valid memory, at least as drawn there. I mean, right, at least as drawn here, it's not going to crash, but the problem is I don't know what's in that box anymore. So maybe it will print 17 if free happened to not change the contents of this box. Maybe it'll print zero if free put it to zero. Maybe it'll print a billion. It's, it's now as good as an uninitialized variable. Does that make sense? This box is now as good as uninitialized. Could we reinitialize the after freeing it? To what? So like p equals something else? Like yeah. Or yeah. So yeah, I can't. I can't change the slide here. But but yes, I could say after I called free p, I could say p equals. So I wouldn't say int star again because I've already declared the variable. But I could say p equals now like something else. Absolutely. Okay. Now maybe there's a kind of a, a natural follow-on question here, which is so what happens if I just don't free, right? Like. Oh man, calling free seems like so much work, right? Like, let's just not free our memory and just move on. Um, this isn't nearly as bad as freeing our memory and then doing something with it afterward. This would be what's called a memory leak. And, and so let's say my program just ended here. I said star p, and then I, I said some stuff, and then my program just ended. Um, well, that, well, what's happening is Malik assumes that we're using this memory until we say we're done until we call free. So we just can't reclaim this memory anymore. And especially if we lose a pointer to it, so let's say the variable p goes away because the function returned, now nobody has a pointer to the box down here. Nobody's keeping track of this memory, and that memory is effectively lost forever, uh, at least for the run of the program. So we can't, we won't be able to reclaim that memory, malloc won't be able to reuse it because it says, oh gosh, I can't use this block of memory, you haven't called free on it yet. So that's a waste of memory, um, and it's, it's not good. It's not as bad as those errors, but still not good. Okay, one other little example with, uh, with malloc is if we see, is here, if we do, um, so you might think, well, why in the world would I call free p twice or something silly like that? Um, that I, I would never do that. Here, but here's an example of how you could accidentally free the same pointer twice. If I have int star p and I have int star q, and they're both pointing at the same, they're both pointing at the same block of memory, then it's very important that I call free on that block once. So from this diagram, what I'm saying is, I need to call free on the address 2000 exactly one time. Whether I call free of p or free of q, doesn't matter, because both of them point to 2,000, but I should only make that free call one time. So then calling free of Q after this free P would cause an error. Any other questions about malloc and free before we switch topics pretty substantially? Okay, so now I'm going to switch to something pretty different, or seemingly pretty different. I'm going to talk about arrays. Now, <laughs> you might be like, wait, why, what? Hold on, like, we've been talking about pointers, we've been talking about the heap, we've been talking about all this stuff. Why, why arrays? Where did arrays come from? And as we'll find out, 
arrays are extremely related to everything that we've talked about so far. We learn in 106b, and actually in 106a to some extent, that an array is just a contiguous block of memory where I can store, um, where I just store, you know, a bunch of ints or a bunch of whatever. And you'll notice that when I called malloc here, I was just responsible for passing it some size. What happens if I pass malloc a different size than size of int? Let's imagine if I pass malloc four times size of int. Well, malloc will dutifully go and allocate a block of size four times, number of bytes in an int is four, it'll just give us a block of size 16. Huh, well that's interesting. We've got this nice little contiguous block of memory now, right? Wouldn't it be really cool if I could then just go in and like use array notation in here or something? And just start writing to bracket zero and bracket one, bracket two, bracket three. Wouldn't that be really, wouldn't that be really awesome? <sighs> well, it turns out, yeah, you you totally can. And that's just that's 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 just how arrays work. So as it turns out, arrays and pointers in C are are pretty close to indistinguishable. This block of code does exactly what you'd expect in terms of. It does exactly what this diagram is showing you. It fills in um, the two, the four, the six, and the eight. Now, from now on, I'm going to draw lines in between each of those, each of these boxes to indicate elements of, separate elements of the array. I'm also going to fill in the addresses to the left, but realize that both of these things are purely cosmetic. That this and this are not at all, do not represent a different picture of memory. So, what we've real, so here we're finding out that if I just malloc the right amount of space, I can start using array notation, and I can pretty much treat this thing like an array of four ints. Question. Yep. So does that mean that when we write code and we expect arrays, it's doing that on the heap instead of stack? Uh, so you're asking about, so uh, it won't do it on the heap unless I call malloc. So we'll see a little bit about stack arrays in a second, which is another way we could get arrays. But I'm introducing it with a malloc for now, but yeah. Question. Yep. Do you think that match like an array or something? No, so can you, you can't mix and match types in an array, just like in C++ or Java. Um, once, you say, once you say, you know, int array, or in this case, int star, um, we're, we're always pointing to ints. This is the value of the array. Do we need uh, ampersand or is it just? So, so far, no. So far, all we got to do is use array indexing. Now, maybe what you're getting at is, well, what about all that ampersand and star stuff that we saw already? Right? How does that relate to this indexing? Yeah, so we're going to get to that. But for now, this syntax as written will work. P bracket 0 will give me this 2, um, P bracket 1, etc. So let's get back to that. How exactly are we relating the two? I just told you that arrays and pointers are kind of the same. I just did this really wacky thing where I, I took some pointer that I was treating with ampersands and stars, and suddenly I start using these bracket notations. Where did this come from? Okay. To explain that, I need to introduce the idea of pointer arithmetic. Here's a new, I'm declaring a new pointer, int star q. And I'm assigning it to this really weird expression, p plus 2. What does p plus 2 do? You might guess if you just looked at p and you said, okay, well, plus 2, does that point to 2002? That would be a reasonable guess. But there's a little bit of a problem with that, which is that 2002 is not any, isn't exactly an integer, right? P, 2002 is halfway into this box, um, which means that an int starting at 2002 would kind of overlap half of that box and half of this one. Turns out C is smarter than that. And C says, well, hey, I know that P is pointing to integers. So when you say P plus 2, I won't just add two bytes. I'll add two integers worth. So P plus 2 says start at the address 2000, because that's what P is. 
skip one integer, two integers, and point there. So Q now stores the address, the address 2008. And it's just a pointer, just like any other thing, any other pointer that we've seen so far, it's pointing to this location. So if I printf star Q, for example, I get the value 6. Is that okay? Plus two times size of int. Does that work also? Uh, so it would not work because size of int is four, and so that would actually turn into p plus eight. Okay. And I mean, okay, well, p plus eight works in the sense that there is some interpretation, but then the compiler will also multiply again by four, and then I'll be off the end of the array. Okay. Does that make sense? So be very careful that when working with pointers here, when working with pointer arithmetic here, we do not want to multiply this 2 by anything. We really just want to say p plus 2, and that will take us here. Um, what yep. happens when you uh, malloc like the size of a double infinite star? Uh, so I guess the short answer is nothing special. So if I malloc, we just have to think about the, the number. We have to figure out what the actual number is inside of this malloc. So if I say malloc size of double, and double is 8, then I'll just get an 8-byte block of memory. If I assign it to an int star, then hey, I guess you could put two ints in it, but you probably shouldn't write it like that. Uh, yes, but not through an int star. Right? If I have an int star and I dereference it, then I wouldn't put a double there, I'd put an int there. Because, putting, because dereferencing an int star gives me an int. Anything else so far? Question. Yep. What if you try to do p bracket 5 and or something? So you're saying, like, if I just go off the end? Yeah. So maybe we'll, we'll, we'll see that a little bit more. Essentially, going off the end of an array, just like it was on Friday, just like it was on, actually, yeah, I don't think we did this too much on Friday, but certainly the, the first day. Uh, going off the end of the array, we get no bounds checking, we get no support. Um, and we'll actually start to see why that is, because all it's actually doing is this kind of arithmetic-y thing behind the scenes. So it's just gonna, it's just gonna walk you off, and then there's, there's nothing there. And will you seg fault? Will you read somebody else's memory? I don't know. Okay. Question. Yep. Is there, so once you've declared, like, are you, you've allocated some memory for like an array, is there a way to extend the size of, of that like memory space, or effectively do you just need to allocate another yeah. like block of memory with yeah. the size that you want and then just free the old memory? Yeah, is there a way to extend memory? Yes, we'll learn about it at the beginning of Friday. <laughs> um, yeah, um, that's actually one of the advantages of using the heap, is that we can extend, whereas if we used We'll see stack arrays later. If we allocate the array on the stack, we cannot extend it. Okay? So I keep on going with this point arithmetic thing. I have told you that p plus 2 gives me a pointer to, to this guy, to this 6. And that star q will then, or sorry, so p plus 2 gives me a, you know, gives me a pointer here. So then star q would then give me this 6. Well, you'll notice that 6 is also p bracket 2. So here's our relationship between array notation and this arithmetic thing. When I say p bracket 2, that is exactly and totally equivalent to saying p plus 2 in parens, we do need the parens here, and then dereference that. These are absolutely 100% equivalent. And so now we can actually see even more of the relation, which is that p bracket 0, I'm just kind of you know, working this out, p bracket 0, just filling it in, is star p plus 0. So as it turns out, star p is actually the same as p bracket 0. So whenever we say arrays and pointers in C are the same thing, this is what we're talking about. We can use both forms of notation. Anytime I wanted to say star p, I could say p bracket 0. Now, if p wasn't pointing at it, uh, an array, 
saying p bracket 0 would just be really confusing. And if it was pointing at an array, using the star notation is kind of unnecessary, but they are equivalent. Couple more things to show you here. Um, so then as a result, if we, we can apply the ampersand operator to something like p bracket 2, so ampersand of p bracket 2 is equivalent to p plus 2. Um, this goes back to something where if I take ampersand star of something, that's, they basically, the ampersand and star would cancel each other out. And so, so as it turns out, p is actually synonymous with ampersand p of 0. Questions about any of that? We'll definitely see a lot of pointer arithmetic uh, through in this week and and next. So um, there's definitely a lot of time for it to kind of all sink in. But I, I expect this to be pretty unfamiliar. Okay. Uh, there's a quick note here about subarrays. I'm mostly gonna I'll skip over this. We'll see it um, in lab, but. Essentially, once I have a pointer q, I can treat q like an array too, because all the syntax is the same. So I'll skip over this. Uh, the, I'll post the slides after lecture, and you'll see this in lab. Um, you know, we'll, we'll maybe come back to this. And then one last note is we talked a little bit about uh, the, we've been showing arrays as they were showing up on the heap. So we using malloc. Here we can also create arrays on the stack using this syntax, which we saw a little bit of before, into ARR bracket 4. For example, we'll allocate these four elements on the stack. Um, the array syntax still works. The pointer syntax still works. ARR is now a pointer to, that's a typo, darn it. Well, it got so close. Uh, go, and so ARR is now effectively operates like the address of the the zeroth index, so it all kind of looks. So the syntaxes pretty much are all the same. There are a couple of differences between stack arrays and heap arrays that you'll you'll see we'll see on Friday, but and next week's lab. But that's that's that so far. Any okay? Couple more things before we we get out. Um, there's one. More thing, again, I can't really go over this too much, um, but don't worry because this is all about lab. I'm all, all about this week's lab. This is a section on strings. What we're talking about here is we're going back to Friday where we talked about, where we saw care star and we said that care star was synonymous with strings. Now we know that care star means pointer to character. And, and now we also know that Pointers and arrays are the same. So is it pointing to one character or is it pointing to many characters? Well, it's actually pointing to, when we see char star, it's almost always pointing to a bunch of characters. We'll understand what a string really is during lab. We'll talk about what the backslash zero is. Here's a quick slide about that, but that's okay. And just a super quick summary. Hopefully you got through the pointer ops and the arrays and the heap stuff. We'll revisit all the heap stuff again. We'll come back to the pointer arithmetic uh, lab all about strings. Otherwise, we will see you next time. Hey, uh, hey. Yeah. Um, I had a question about the yeah. part where you're